Hi everyone, I'm the project manager for the Purcell Mountains Caribou Herd Augmentation Project. I'm presenting on behalf of the project team. It includes a bunch of dedicated members from across the province. Uh, this is a very ambitious, complex, logistically challenging and high profile project and basically can be viewed as a critical intervention to try and assist a herd that's at imminent risk of extirpation. So I can outline why we did it, how we did it, what happened, and what we've learned from that, and what we're <laughs> planning to do next. So the obvious question, why augment? Why undertake such a, a difficult and, uh, and high profile project? Um, the Purcell South herd is a very small herd. There's estimated to be uh, as of 2008, only 14 animals in this herd. So they're at a very high risk of extirpation or uh, dramatic reduction in the population from random events, as occurred in Banff, we heard about earlier. Uh, it's an aging population with very low calf recruitment. And at this stage, I'd also like to point out that this project is uh, supported by research, uh, predation risk research. You might have seen Heather Leach's poster the other night uh, from the University of Victoria, as well as a partnership with the University of Calgary, Calgary sorry, uh, to do diagnostic and physiological research. So uh, our donor herd is uh, in the extreme northwest of the province, the Level Cotty herd. It is a northern ecotype woodland caribou herd. The recipient herd is in the very southeast part of the province, the Purcell South, almost the most southerly mountain caribou herd in the province. Um, the donor herd was selected on not just biological factors, obviously, uh, but it was based on the fact that that's a robust herd, very uh, large population, several thousand animals, and uh, we had supported the Taltan First Nation um, to undertake this transplant. And options are very limited for uh, donor herds in the mountain caribou range, as you all know. And just to, to reiterate that it's not only biological considerations that we had to uh, had to deal with. There's a lot of socio-political considerations as well. And we collared 20 animals in October 2011, five months prior to the transplant itself, so that we could obtain pre-movement data on the level cotty herd uh, and uh, assist future management of that herd. A little bit about the methods. Uh, we took some time to confirm these methods, and although there have been a number of transplants across North America, uh, there were relatively few uh, people with expertise that we could consult. Um, Brad Culling of Diversified Environmental did the net gunning uh, in October as well as in late February the following year. Um, caribou were captured by net gun and once we determined that they were acceptable for, for moving, they were sedated and loaded into uh, a helicopter. The Bell 206 was used for the net gunning and A-STARS were used to transport the caribou, sedated caribou, uh, to a staging area at Dees Lake. And we had four veterinarians involved in the project, led by our provincial wildlife vet, Dr. Helen Schwancha, but uh, veterinarians from the University of Calgary Park and Parks Canada assisted us in this project. And they rode in the back of the uh, helicopters while the caribou were being transported to the staging area. So this is a photo at the staging area at the Dees Lake Airport. And uh, once the caribou arrived there, they were removed from the helicopter, examined and weighed and uh, biological samples were taken, blood samples as well as tissue samples, and prophylactic <coughs> medications were, uh, were administered, uh, including vitamin E and selenium and anti-inflammatory drugs. And for those hands-on biologists in the room, ketamine and metatomidine were the sedatives with a reversal agent uh, called antipamazole, and there was also a long-lasting tranquilizer used uh, as aperone. And um, all of the uh, physiological samples that were taken uh, have been shipped to the University of Calgary to develop a long-term database, a comprehensive database on caribou health. So caribou were carried on specially designed carry blankets uh, from the, the processing area into the truck. Um, just I want to note the, the handles at, at the head and neck end of the carry blankets to keep their head elevated. Uh, there were also some stretchers that were used. Uh, all the caribou were fitted. All the caribou were fitted with ATS Iridium GPS collars and ear tags to enable uh, identification from a distance after release. And we selected ground transport for logistical reasons as well as cost considerations. We were considering air transport, but because of the very unpredictable weather in the Deep Lake area, uh, we decided to go with ground transport. And we did administer a long-lasting uh, tranquilizer to keep the animals calm during transit. 
This is uh, Dr. Schwancha and Bill Jacks administering the reversal drug in the transport trailer. And um, after that, uh, caribou were uh, transported about three, two to three in a compartment for the journey to Kimberley. This is at the release staging area in Kimberley on Tech Cole's property. Uh, the transport truck, uh, we, used a, we originally considered using a couple of uh, cattle trucks, but, uh, or horse trailers I should say, but we decided on a, a larger air ride uh, truck to reduce jostling during the long transit. It was about a 30 hour trip for the caribou. And uh, after they arrived at the, the staging area, they were released into the corral. They were put through a squeeze and sedated a second time for transport to the Alpine. This is at the Alpine release site in the Purcell Mountains. Uh, they were again loaded into the back of an A-Star helicopter for transport to the, release, uh, the Alpine release site. And here's the, uh, a shot of the crew taking the caribou out of the helicopter. And the release sites were chosen for logistical reasons and the proximity to the staging area. Uh, at the time of release, the weather was rapidly deteriorating, so uh, this is one of the challenges of field work, field projects like this. Uh, cloud cover was coming down, high winds made it extremely dangerous for the pilot to uh, try and release the caribou in the original site, so we had to release a, a second group in an alternate release site, so just illustrating the importance of having a plan B and C and D. And uh, we weren't able to hold them any longer in the release corral because the corral was too small and uh, we figured they had been under significant enough stress for a long enough period that that wasn't worth the risk. This is just an example of how the caribou were handled uh, at the release site. This is actually Keith Noel, the Taltan First Nation, and at this point I just want to uh, stress that the First Nations were very important partners in this project, and we were fortunate enough that Keith was able to participate at both the capture end and the release end. And so uh, they're very important partners, but it's also created an interesting dynamic the Tall Tan First Nation at the donor herd end uh, is very much in favor of predator management, whereas the Tanaha First Nation at the release end views that as uh, arrogant and inconsistent with their worldview, and so they're not in favor of, of uh, predator management at all. So that uh, puts an interesting dynamic in the mix. i just like to also point out this is a tale of two herds. It's not just about the release herd that we're trying to augment. We need to always keep in mind the donor herd. So at the release site, before the, uh, the reversal agent was administered, the caribou were packed in snow to keep them cool. You might have seen some of this footage actually on the CBC News that night. Um, but uh, they were also, snow was packed around them to keep their heads elevated and they were, they were monitored constantly at this time. Uh, we were trying to uh, release caribou in, or reverse the sedative in uh, groups of four, but this started to cause bottlenecks three to four but it started to cause bottlenecks, so we had to do it more, more rapidly than that. Uh, just some notes on the Purcell Mountains, uh, the release area. This is a typical a photo of some typical habitat in that area. It's in the uh, interior cedar hemlock and Engelmann spruce sub subalpine fir ecosystems. Uh, there's varied land use in this area. There's extensive forest harvesting in some parts, but uh, by and large, the, the release area itself has very limited industrial development. Uh, there is no heli skiing at all, and there's, uh, there's a gradient of snowmobile use. There's some areas with legal closures. There's about 213,000 hectares that have been legally protected from road building and forest harvesting uh, under the Forest Rage Practices Act. And I'd just like to point out, uh, based on historical hunting data, uh, there were 11 caribou a year harvested between 1964 to 71. So Trevor Kinley in 2010 estimated an original population of several hundred in this area. Uh, but in 1995, there was 63 caribou counted. Uh, they declined in 2000 to 13 animals, and in uh, 2009, the last estimate was only 14 animals. Again, sorry. Um, this is just a photo. We've been monitoring these caribou very closely through the GPS collars, as well as we did a calf recruitment flight in early June. Uh, calves are dropped uh, somewhat later than further north in this area. Um, this is a photo of a resident herd. We have four collared animals in the resident herd. Um, and during the helicopter flight, uh, as a result of the, our, our survey and the telemetry data, we saw a very dramatic response to helicopter activity, stands to reason. Uh, so we curtailed any further calf recruitment surveys. So we're not sure how many calves were born, uh, although the, the uh, movements of both the resident caribou and the transplanted caribou 
do seem to indicate that they've, they segregated themselves and they stopped moving, so it does indicate that they at least attempted to calf. So the key question, how will we define success in this project? Our goal is 24 animals one year post-transplant, 100 animals in 15 years after the transplant, and a self-sustaining herd in perpetuity. That being said, there's been some very significant challenges. As you're all aware, it's, caribou are not an easy species to manage. There's many different factors, and the biological factors are only one element. Uh, we've learned a lot through this project, uh, but there's been a lot of socio-political uh, elements that we've had to consider. And I'm going to review some of these challenges in detail. I'd like to thank Heather Leach for this map. This is, shows some of the uh, very dramatic movements that these caribou made post-release. So caribou, are, by their nature, are wanderers. As you can see, there's been several that have moved into Montana. Some moved into the Rocky Mountains. Uh, one caribou actually swam Kootenai Lake three times. And uh, we started getting media reports of caribou on, uh, on the septic fields near Fort Steele. Um, so there, we also have five collared wolves in this area and seven collared cougars uh, to support the predation risk research. Unfortunately, there's been no end of uh, challenges with the technology on those collars, so that's been uh, somewhat problematic. Uh, one story you may have seen in the, in the media is uh, one caribou that wandered into Montana, we received a mortality signal and thought that there would actually be a, a dead caribou, but the U.S. Fish and Wildlife or Montana Fish and Game people uh, went and found it had tick paralysis and violated Homeland Security, transported it back to Canada for us. Um, and so there's been a lot of international cooperation on this. Now the dreaded slide. Uh, I just had to update this two days ago. Unfortunately, Leo de Groot, our regional lead in the Kootenays, isn't here with us today. But uh, we've had a significant number of mortalities. Uh, two caribou died during the uh, original capture. Uh, one uh, asphyxiated in the helicopter between the capture site and the staging area. One died in the truck on the way there. Uh, since then, there's been four taken by cougars, three taken by wolves, three by accidents. One fell through a snow hole, one fell off a cliff, and one other uh, broke its leg and four for unknown reasons. So we only have five of the original 19 that were released remaining in the Purcell Mountains. Um, but without exception, all of the predator-related mortalities have been in areas that are not considered caribou habitat. So it's all the caribou that have wandered below about 1,400 meters in elevation are getting picked off by the, by the predators. And it's the wandering that we're really having to manage. Uh, one of the other challenges here is, you know, uh, the powers that be wanted this to be a very high-profile uh, news story. Uh, that was achieved. And we had many articles on this. Uh, one of the CBC, this is just an example of a local Kootenai uh, newspaper, uh, CBC radio, or radio interviews, uh, CBC News had headlines, Five Caribou Die. Um, and we, it's very interesting as a, pub, a barometer of public opinion to see some of the comments. Uh, some of my favorites, uh, uh, were, uh, oh, I wonder, did you plant them too deep or too close together? Um, did you ever wake up not knowing where you were or how you got there? And, uh, dear biologists, please transplant more caribou. Signed, the cougars. <laughs> so, donor herd movements. It's important to maintain a sense of humor when you're trying to undertake projects like this. Again, this is a tale of two herds. This is some of the data from the Level Cotty herd up north the donor herd, and the, the movements of that herd have been much more extensive than we anticipated. Some have even moved up into the Yukon, so uh, that's, gonna, that's made things more difficult. Next steps, we are planning for another transplant in 2013. We are reviewing the donor herd. Uh, it's unlikely that the Tall Ten will be as supportive this year. We, have, we do need to, to sit down with them and talk about our options. Uh, we're looking at options for transport, including the use of two trucks. We've uh, looked at an option for soft release, and one of the key uh, success uh, indicators, I think, would be to, or uh, we want to give these caribou the best possible chance of success. So uh, soft release to try and get them to interact more with the resident animals and uh, learn their habitat use patterns would likely increase the probability uh, of survival, as well as choosing a donor herd that is, uh, has more mountain caribou, mountain ecotype uh, behavioral patterns would likely help, but as you know, that's, there's very few herds that are even remotely suitable for a donor herd for a project like this. Just like to acknowledge all the participants in this, uh, some very dedicated staff uh, from uh, across the province that went for without sleep for over, almost 48 hours to make this happen. Uh, the Tall Tan and Tanaha First Nations, University of Calgary, University of Victoria, 
BC Hydro, Parks Canada, a wild site whose local environmental group and Kootenays, and Montana and Washington Fish and Game as well, and the U.S. Forest Service, and uh, the Columbia Basin Trust. 